In the summer of 1963, President John F. Kennedy announces a major new aerospace program. Our strong faith in the future. He calls for America to build and fly a supersonic airliner that will cruise at over 3,000 kilometers per hour. Program in civilian aviation. Supersonic flight. This is the story of Kennedy's dream, an aircraft at the cutting edge of technology, a plane designed to fly faster and higher than any of its rivals, the Boeing 2707. One of John Kennedy's heroes was John Glenn, the first American in space. But Glenn was also the first man to fly America coast to coast at supersonic speed in the year 1957. Ever since that flight, Kennedy had dreamed of building an American supersonic transport. Others had that same dream. The British began their supersonic aircraft program in 1943, midway through the war. Uh, it was a, a it was a design, obviously, at that stage, which called for an aircraft to be capable of uh, Mach 1.5. That's one and a half times the speed of sound, or about uh, 1,000 miles an hour, which is, is really quite adventurous when you think about uh, the speeds they're achieving in those days. The British had several projects. Among these were the Miles M52 and the de Havilland DH-108 Swallow. But Britain was beaten to the prize by Chuck Yeager, flying the American Bell X-1. To tell you the truth, I was hopping mad because I realized we could have done it and we'd missed the boat by cancellation. Not with the DH-108, but with the Miles M-52. I was to be the pilot of the Miles M-52, so I'd followed this carefully and we were 80% ready for the first flight when without any warning without any consultation the aircraft was cancelled on October the 14th 1947 the rocket powered Bell X-1 became the first aircraft to fly faster than sound the British were really upset that the Americans had been first through the sound barrier because British technology was ahead of the Americans. The British just fluffed it, lacked the guts to do it. The reason the British gave for cancelling the Miles 52 was lack of knowledge surrounding what happens to an aircraft as it approaches the sound barrier. When an aircraft approaches the speed of sound, uh, several things happen. The, the most um, disturbing of which for the occupants of the aircraft is the aircraft begins to shake and rumble depending on how rapidly or how slow you approach the speed of sound. But in aerodynamic terms a wave builds up, an area of compressibility builds up, a shock wave. And what that does is that that causes increased drag and increased heating on the aircraft such that as you approach the speed of sound as the shock wave passes over the flying surfaces uh, what that does, it, it causes the wings to lose lift, both above and below the wing. And that has a downward effect on the aircraft, so the aircraft starts, will start to dive if you don't do anything else about it. One method of countering this was to use powered control surfaces, particularly the elevators on the tail. In subsonic flight, the air flows over the wing normally, creating lift. But in the transonic region, a shock wave builds up which creates drag. At the speed of sound, this shock wave sits on the wing creating a downward pressure. Powered control surfaces counteract this by forcing the nose of the aircraft up. You first start to notice the, the problem of, of approaching the, uh, the transonic area, uh, approaching the speed of sound from about 0.9 so nine-tenths of the speed of sound at sea level. And there you'll begin to experience a buffet as the shock wave begins to build up. And as you approach the speed of sound, the closer you get to speed the, the speed of sound, the greater that buffet will be until that moment when you pop through the other side and that shock wave uh, is then traveling behind the aircraft, you then 
punch through into an area of far more stable air, an area of almost quietness, if you like. By the mid-1950s, military aircraft were routinely flying beyond the sound barrier. But they did so only for short periods. Sustained supersonic flight was a much bigger problem than just punching a hole in the sound barrier. Supersonic flight for passengers is actually very di different from supersonic flight uh, in the military context. Uh, if you're going to fly passengers at supersonic speed, you have to fly them for a long, long time at high speed, whereas military operations tend to be a quick dash. Only one country decided to tackle the challenge. Defeated in the race through the sound barrier, the British now embarked on the design and development of a supersonic airliner. It was to signal the start of a race that would transform the world of aviation. On March the 10th, 1956, the British re-entered the supersonic stakes with a vengeance when the experimental Fairy Delta II captured the world absolute speed record at 1,820 kilometers per hour. The Fairy Delta II introduced a series of revolutionary features. A long, narrow delta, perfect for cruising beyond the sound barrier, and a drooping nose to allow the pilot a better view on takeoff and landing. Inspired by the success of the Fairy Delta, the British established a committee to coordinate the development of a supersonic airliner. The most interesting aspect of the Ferry Delta II that we see uh, on today's Concorde was the drooping nose. Uh, now what that is, is it, it is it's simply, as you see in Concorde, a nose that kinks. One of the problems with the Delta winged aircraft, and an aircraft that is, is designed for going supersonic speeds, is that in order to fly very fast, obviously you need something that is as aerodynamic as possible. The problem is they are very, very difficult to fly at low speeds. So when they come into land they have a very high angle of attack and very very difficult then for the pilots to see what they're doing. So they then put this kink in the nose if you like to have this cantilevered nose such that in takeoff and landing to give the pilots better visibility uh, they, they put this design feature in which we see today. In March 1959 the preliminary design work had progressed to a point where the supersonic transport committee was able to report its broad recommendations. There were two main recommendations. The first was for a, a small, fairly simple aircraft uh, to carry around 100 passengers and do uh, about Mach 1.2. The second design was for a 150-seater that should have been capable of a Mach 1.8, which was considerably bigger and considerably faster. By 1959, the British thinking had crystallized into two projects, uh, a medium-range supersonic airliner, which had a rather crazy M-shaped wing, uh, very difficult to build. Uh, and the other project was the classic, what's now the classic long, thin delta for a supersonic airliner that could fly across the Atlantic. Now would emerge a decision that would shape the whole future of the race to build a supersonic airliner. When they awarded the design study contract in 1960, the British made it a condition to BAC, who, who got the contract, that they should seek international collaboration for the building of the supersonic transporter. The first country BAC approached was the United States. But in 1960, there was little interest shown in the USA for collaboration. So the British turned to France as a potential ally. The British and French eventually decided to cooperate because the supersonic airliner project was just too big for either of them to do on their own. It was helped by the fact that the two different design teams in France and in England had more or less come to the same conclusion about what the aircraft should look like. The aircraft was to be a delta-winged design. It was to be called Concorde, a word common to both languages which means agreement or harmony. But to become credible, Concorde needed customers in the airlines. In June 1963, Concorde received the major airline order that meant it would fly. And the order came not from Europe, 
but from America's own leading airline, Pan Am. Well, Pan Am was such a good customer that they could go in and play one uh, aircraft factory uh, leader against another. And, and, and Tripp didn't mind going in threatening and saying, look, if you don't do this, I'm going to get somebody else to do it. And if I have to go to Europe, I'm going to Europe. Uh, <clears throat> Tripp was an overpowering figure in the industry at that time. Pan American Airways began operations on